I think we shall get started. Uh, thank you ever so much for everyone that has joined us today. Um, today, uh, the subject of uh, the webinar is all around um, security, getting a better night's sleep, I suppose having things under better control. I'm unsure if Arctic Wolf can give me a better night's sleep. Uh, Nick, if it does, it would be a bit of a, a magic pill, but uh, I'd like to um, introduce my co-host, uh, Nick Dyer. Nick, don't know if you want to just introduce yourself. Yeah, hi Barry, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Nick Dyer. Um, I work for an organisation called Arctic Wolf and we're one of the uh, leading uh, vendors in uh, what we call security operations. And uh, I'll be working alongside Barry today to take you through today's webinar discussing cyber risk and how we can all you know, try, try and do what we can to sleep better at night. Fantastic. So thank you ever so much, Nick. So uh, those of you that have been to our Define Tomorrow events before, you'll recognise Nick. Nick's worked with us for a number of years over a number of different technologies. So it's great now to be working very closely with Nick and the team at Arctic Wolf. And to those of you that are really sort of looking into security and have strategies to help improve security within your organisations, I recommend checking out the events page of the Computer Ford website. We've got an event happening at Silverstone Race Circuit uh, towards the end of the month uh, where Nick, alongside other presenters, will be Presenting all about cybersecurity. And we've got some exciting uh, demonstrations there around uh, sort of how a cyber attack happens and some other things. So make sure you check that out. So, Nick, over to you, I suppose, to, to, to lead today's conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, what I thought I'd do is I'd uh, put something on the screen that we can all see um, because, you know, as, as wonderful I, and kind of groomed as I am, uh, looking at me for the next 30 minutes is not going to be that much fun. So uh, Barry, can you see my see what I'm sharing on the screen, buddy? Yeah, that's all good. Very good. Okay. Yeah. So um, so I work for an organization called Arctic Wolf, and uh, we work alongside Computer World to deliver uh, security operations uh, outcomes to customers in the UK and Ireland. Um, I'm a systems engineer here at Arctic Wolf, and I've been here for actually 12 months. It was my 12-month anniversary um roughly two or three weeks ago so uh it's it... a market but it's been going now for 10 years in in uh, the united states and canada uh i'm on social media just like barry and and the rest of computer world and you can reach me at nick underscore dire underscore and i'm also on linkedin as well uh if you happen to use those platforms so the the topic of today and the thing that we thought would be a, a good kind of investigation would be uh, how can we investigate, you know, looking at and thinking about cyber risk and ultimately trying to do what we can to uh, deliver, deliver a holistic view of security and security operations? Because really, at the end of the day, there is no um, magic formula. There is, there is no secret source to security. It's all about strength and depth, and it's also about uh, ensuring that you're just continually iterating and continually evolving your posture uh, to the latest threats and to the latest risks that potentially are in your environment. So I thought we we, we spend the next uh, 30 to, you know, kind of 25, 30, 35 minutes just going through some of this and giving you some real world context as to what we've seen in the market with an Arctic Wolf and how we can help you with those outcomes. So um, just a bit about us. If you haven't heard of us before, um, we're, um, we're we're on the path of of one of the the next biggest security vendors. It's uh, we're one of these hyper growth uh, vendors that you hear about in the market today. And um, like I mentioned, you know, I joined this company about twelve months ago, um, and I was one of the first entrants into the UK market. Uh, in fact, in the in the in the EMEA market, we were founded in twenty twelve. Um, and when I joined, we had about 700 employees worldwide, and we're now actually at 1,800 employees as of this week. Uh, we hired 111 people this week, which is just absolutely bonkers. Um, and we're, our customer count is also growing through the roof as well. When I joined, we had uh, probably about, around about 1,500 customers worldwide. Uh, we're now at 3,800 customers and above. Um, and uh, we've won a huge amount of accolades in the last three or four years as well. And uh, we're a Gartner Cool vendor, and we're, we were uh, one of the most innovative companies on the Fast Company Register. Uh, we won CRM Product of the Year. We're on the Forbes list of best startup employers. Um, but we're also um, uh, really focusing on you know human well-being and uh, employment, and making sure that people are just enjoying where we work. And we're one of the top workplaces in 2021 in the USA. 
um, and we had a three percent attrition in, and in security that's a huge accomplishment because the one problem with security is it's just not enough good people um, so we're all about growing but growing sustainably but also making sure that we're retaining the talent that we have um, what we do at Arctic Wolf is we're not a product company and I've worked with product companies as long as I can remember and I've worked with Computer World in those product companies as, as a vendor partner relationship. Arctic Wolf don't, don't deliver a product. It's a, it's a true end-to-end -end service and it's complemented by the products that they make, but it's delivered uh, as a service in what we call a concierge approach. Uh, and that concierge approach is where you get the people and the processes not just the product to deliver the security outcome that you're looking for. Uh, that might be monitoring and response, it might be risk and vulnerability management, or it might be security awareness training. The reason why we do what we do ultimately is we believe, and, and actually the, the industry has really come around to our view, is that security ultimately has an effectiveness problem. And over the years, 10, 15, 20 years, We've all been very accustomed to buying more products to try and fit holes in our security posture, where it might be endpoint protection, it might be a firewall, it might be cloud security, it might be zero trust, it might be, uh, well, you, you name it, AI and machine learning magic boxes. Ultimately, we're very accustomed to buying a new thing to fit a potential gap in the armor that we, we foresee. But the problem is if we don't have the people and the processes to operationalize all those products, you end up with a huge amount of alerts and a noise and just things that are going on, but you don't have the people to know how to respond to those problems. And the issue with cyber has never been more important because of the, the Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict that we've seen. We've got the nation state attacks. Uh, we've got things like Emotech coming back round again. Cybersecurity is just one of the things that is now at the board level, right? I saw a report from the UK government that came out yesterday, uh, which then reported that, you know, at a C suite and a board level, cybersecurity is like in the top five concerns. But they look at cyber not as a technical level, they look at cyber as risk. And that's how we need to think about um, cyber in IT and delivering IT services. It's not about what cyber does in terms of protection. It's about reducing risk to the business. And that risk to the business could be in the form of, you know, delivering vulnerability management to make sure that we don't get breached. It could be making sure that we're always educating our employees so they're not the weakest link. It's all about reducing that risk to the business to make sure that you can't have that data exfiltration or you might not be, you know, held to ransom. Whereas if you think about products, you know, like backup vendors, storage vendors, where I've worked most of my life, we think about a product that fixes the ransomware problem. Well, ransomware is not a problem. It's the outcome of not fixing the vulnerability that you had that you were exposed by, and that's how the ransomware got in. So it's all about reducing risk in the business, and how can we start going about that holistically? Because where we are now is not where we were, I don't know, two, three years ago. Two, three years ago, before COVID, we were all working from offices and we were all uh, not really remote working. And we had some requirements to use the cloud, but we weren't really fully adopting the cloud. Whereas if you look at where we are today, post COVID, everyone's working remotely. And if you're not working remotely, you've got employees that do want to work remotely. And that's where you hear about that great resignation and the, the cyber gap and all that good stuff as well. But the whole COVID exposure to us in IT ultimately changed our mindset to do public cloud and software as a service first. And this is the, the major change in trend I've seen in organizations, which is they've now just decided to go, I'm going to run my on-prem, but all new stuff is going to go to a cloud service of whether I run it myself or whether it's going to be SaaS, but that's where it's going to go first. And I then have to justify why to do it on-prem later on. Now, your mileage may vary. You may be uh, different to that. You might all be in the cloud. You might be on-prem still and maybe only dipping your toe into 365 to start with. But it is very, very uh, obvious now that it's a hybrid world where most organizations are looking to adopt as many cloud services as they possibly can. 
The observation I find though is that those cloud services may not be from the same vendor. You might have cloud services from Microsoft. You might have DevOps doing cloud services in AWS. Uh, you might be using cloud services from security products like Palo Alto Networks. Uh, you might be doing cloud um, kind of data management. You might be doing um, cloud file organizations with cloud file shares. You might be doing things like iManage or, or HiQ. And so what that ultimately leads to is cloud sprawl. We've now got so much data spread across all these different cloud platforms with all the different alerts and logs that are going across these cloud platforms, but I don't have any way to unify the visibility of those clouds. That then leads to this whole concept of more tools. And we've seen the explosion of, of marketing, you know, of how great AI and machine learning is, um, zero trust, and the list goes on, et cetera, et cetera. XDR is the latest one that we're all talking about. And so what we've done is we've implemented these tools. So if you didn't, if you weren't using VPNs previously, uh, during COVID, everyone just rushed to enable VPN just to try and make your users work remotely. But they also then broke a lot of their security policies just to make it work properly and just to make people be able to traverse into your file shares and to get access to documents and to be able to publish things is what they needed to. And that's where zero trust has come around because zero trust is all about making sure that everyone's authenticated all the way down the line and that you're not trusting anyone in that exposure from the endpoint through to the cloud service, to the user and to the outcome that they're trying to drive. And then we see other technologies like, like you know, who, tri who triumph AI and machine learning. You don't need to hire people. Machine learning will do all that work for you. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a marketing kind of uh, word soup, should we say. Um, it does work for some people, but you still need people and processes that go with it. And because of that, you still need to hire. Um, hiring is not going away. And the cyber skills gap in the UK is real. Um, and in fact, if you've got an in-house security team today, you probably don't have a big security team. You've probably got a couple of people. Uh, it might be yourself. It might even be that you're the VMware administrator or the Hyper-V administrator and the storage administrator and the network admin and the security admin, because security has become part of the job of infrastructure um, and is now you know, kind of burdened on top to be able to drive the outcome that you need. Because of that, really, what we're doing is we're stringing together processes ad hoc. How do we build this? How should we do it? How many tools do we have? What's our incident response? What do we do if we get a threat at two in the morning? I don't really know, but we're going to try and string this together as best we can. And that ultimately is why... When you do get hit, because unfortunately, getting hit is a likelihood these days. It's not an if, it's going to be a when. You need to have a defined incident response plan. You can't just have this assumed to think that, you know, oh, I'll wake this person up and they'll do this and they'll do that. You absolutely need to have everything defined and, and categorized with the people and the responsibilities, including your third parties that you're going to pull in and how much they're going to cost and how long it's going to take and what the SLA is going to be to make sure that you've got that defined for the outcomes that you need. Right? Ad hoc processes in security just doesn't fly anymore. And I mentioned this is now the big headache in uh, the C-suite and at your board level. Um, and so this is how we're starting to see all of these demands morph around um, in the UK market. Now, I've also got some other things to do with the UK, which which also helps paint a picture. The cyber firm, the, the UK firm suffering cyber sales gap is, is a real thing. It's really hard to hire. It's even harder to retain really, really good people. And 50% of all firms today are suffering these gaps. And you know what we're seeing is, and it's really horrible to see, which is some firms are saying, well, I'm going to hire this person, but I don't really want to train them too much because if I train them too much, they're going to leave for a better paid job elsewhere, uh, which is which is awful to hear. But it's it's because it, there's a real um, uh, employee war going on now for hiring um, that is now become a, a a pace where we're trying to retain our people and bring new people in, but it's a real uh, conflict to try and get those people in because you're fighting with everyone else for a very very defined small pool of, of resource and people that you need to go after. Ransomware is on the rise. We all know that. This isn't going to go away. This is not something that's going to plateau or is going to fail out. It is on the rise. 
but it's on the rise, not because of nation state attacks. It's not on the rise because of the latest zero day, although Log4j does kind of combat that a little bit. It's on the rise just because vulnerabilities aren't being patched. It's really as simple as that. It's because you might be using a vendor's firewall or VPN that has a vulnerability that should be resolved or should be patched, but you haven't got around to doing it yet because you're just too busy. And you hear about all, all of us security vendors talking about the latest threats. If you just fix the, the kind of vulnerabilities that are in your environment, and if you just pit, patch those as quickly as you possibly can, that will get you probably eight to the tenth of the way there in solving your cyber um, kind of risk within your environment. But you've got to know what your vulnerabilities are before you know how to patch them. And therein lies the problem. Because if you do a vulnerability scan, you end up with like hundreds of problems, and then you get no real guidance about what to fix. And you read about Twitter and blogs and you know all the things that we read about and on the register and bleeping computer, and it sounds like it's the worst thing in the world. But actually, it's probably not. So you need to, need to weigh up what's important to you and how to patch them versus what's not really that important and where, where the weighting of whether you're going to be affected by it versus what the outcome is going to be, which is obviously a breach. So you need to make sure that you're doing this continually. Um, that doesn't help with the cyber skill gap, of course. But it's it's about doing continuous audits. And historically, you know, if you look at Cyber Essentials, Cyber Essentials was historically a once a year evaluation. You did that evaluation, and uh, and you know our friends at Computer World, Cyber Essentials, uh, you know auditors and accredited uh, compliance auditors. You did that once a year, and then you got accredited, and then you waited for another year. So much, so many things happen in those twelve months. So you can't just do this once a year and be done with it. it you need to do this kind of every week or every month, and just kind of skim off the top of what to do and how to do it, and making sure that you're just always looking at what's really going on. To the board and to the C-suite, it's about cyber insurance. We've seen an increase in premiums of cyber insurance of about 33% um, over the last 12 months. And that's just because most organizations aren't doing their vulnerability scans. And they're not really just doing the easy stuff. And what they're then doing is they're then getting hit. And then they're rolling back, uh, sorry, falling back on cyber insurance pay out on the ransomware attack or pay out on what the business outcome was. And so what's the what's the net net of that? Cyber insurance renewals go up, but also now they're passing out these uh, checklists and spreadsheets that you've got to maintain to make sure that you're going to be um, sufficient to be insured. And if you look at, compare that to driving in the UK now, you know, we've seen our premiums go up. Our premiums have gone up in the UK just because people are, you know, feigning crashes, for example. But also, if you then look at the other side of it, you know, you can now get black boxes in your car that records how you drive, uh, how your, you know, how your behavior is, your speeds that you drive at, and whether you're a good driver. And if you're a good driver, your insurance premium goes down. That's what the insurance companies are doing within cyber. They want to make sure that you've got the best of breed, that you've got the coverage, that you've got the easy stuff like multi-factor authentication in place. Because if you don't, you're more likely to get attacked. And, you know, again, ransomware, you know, the, the big hoo-ha on ransomware and the, the, the sticker headline of this it is not going, it's not going to go away. Uh, and the average cost of the data breach last year was about 3.36 million. Now, I want, to take, I want you to, again, take that with a pinch of salt because the way that ransomware um, payments are worked, by the way, they're worked on the size of organization. So what they tend to do is they, they tend to kind of look in your environment and they don't just come in and then hit you with ransomware straight away. Uh, they lay dormant in your environment for a period of time. It's called the dwell time. And so what they do is that they observe and they do data exfiltration. Uh, and they observe, you know, how much data do you, how much money do you make? What's your profit margin, um, you know, this year versus last year? And they start to get, you know, kind of financial information. And so what they then do is they then hit you with the with a ransomware request of a certain amount of money that you're going to be able to pay. And so they say, oh, it's only six months of your profit margin. You should be able to pay this and we'll get you back online. You shouldn't really ever pay a ransom, by the way. But um, they don't, they don't hit, if you're a small firm of like 250 employees, you're not going to be hit with like a 5 million pound ransom. 
That's not the way this works. So, um, so just take that with a pinch of salt. It's all to do with the size of organization that you are. So, well, so how have we got in the, in, in the state that we're in? Well, all of the things that we've been doing actually isn't bad. You know, the products that we've been buying and the products that we operate are really, really good. They do great things, right? Firewalls do great things. Endpoint protection has got a lot better in the last 15 years or so. Should we, you know, cloud security has come a long, long way. We've now seen the uh, the rise of Microsoft as a, as a security leader, um, so much so that Google are making series of acquisitions to try and keep up because they're being disrupted by Microsoft in that manner. It's not about the products that you're buying. The, the failures are not in the product itself. The failures are in the operational aspect of those products because now we've just got too many things to look at and too many things to manage. Uh, on average, uh, a UK firm has between 10 to 15 security tools that people are monitoring or managing on a daily basis. That's a lot of, that's a lot of noise and emails that go into a shared mailbox every single day. Um, and, and Barry, I don't know about you, but how many mails do you tend to get per day on you know, your MSP environment for monitoring and alerting and noise? Uh, I couldn't give you an exact number, but the, as I say, the challenge is everything wants to alert you these days. It's in, almost an information overload. Yeah, and you know, it's text message, WhatsApps, Signal, Twitter, you know, the list goes on. Because ultimately, and it's quite ironic actually, the more tools you actually have in place to do a job, the lower your ability is to respond to an attack because you're looking at more things or too many things, and you can't focus the mind on the things that you need to look at. That's where Arctic Wolf comes in because we're not here to replace tools. The tools you've got are pretty good. Um, it's all about building a holistic picture and view about all of those tools in one place. And it's quite it's quite interesting because you know I'm I'm not a I'm not a legacy security person. I've been in, in IT for 20 odd years and I've kind of flitted around virtualization and cloud and storage and AI and all these different platforms. Um, and, and what we're now seeing is, is the latest marketing buzzword in security is what's called extended detection and response or XDR. And ultimately, this is the product vendors, again, who are now trying to sell a new product um, to try and drive the outcome of you buying something new from them. It's all and so over the years, we've seen, you know, endpoint protection, we've heard endpoint detection and response, we've heard SIM, although you may not have heard of SIM up until now, which is all about log monitoring and log analytics. Um, AI and machine learning has been one in the last two or three years, and now we've got extended detection and response or XDR. It's really just more tools to do more things that you've got to be able to manage and monitor yourself. And that's not what Arctic Wolf is all about. In fact, what we're all about is thinking um, from a tools-based mindset to operational mindsets. So the first thing that we say is, well, the tools you've got are probably, probably pretty good. Don't rip and replace those tools, right? We want to be able to work with what you've already got. So, But you need to be able to operationalize that tech stack and send it to a cloud platform for normalization and for passing, but also then for alerting on the data that we're seeing out of it. Then it's about embracing security operations. So how can we holistically design security operations across a framework, which then gives us coverage across attack services and attack types? So we're not just looking for, you know, the the easy things. We're looking for, you know, kind of the emerging threats, and we're looking for the 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 the, the cloud threats, and we're looking for even the, uh, the 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 mega events like Log4j and and Spring4 Shell and a few other things that we've seen as well. And how can you embed that into your organization and harness that to drive the outcome? And then finally, how do you build resiliency in your organization? Because it's not about a product, because a product is a point solution that you have to then manage. It's about how can we give a turnkey experience where you get the guidance and you get the protection, but also then you get the tactical and strategic um, kind of consultancy and actions to try and iterate and improve your security posture. Because as I started, the security is not one thing. You don't just do one thing in security and then you say, I am secure. It needs to be iterated every month, 
every quarter, every year. All right. And there was a, a really, really good. See if I can. Um, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but there was a there was a brilliant mind map that was posted on LinkedIn, which I'll put in the chat panel. Um, and it just shows you, you know, it's, it's the it's a mind map of a C CISO, and it just shows you everything that needs to be thought of, and it and and that CISO has actually detailed the top five things that they're looking at for this year, and it's quite interesting actually. One of the very first things that they mention is uh, normalization and rationalization of tools, and the second one is then looking at things like open source technologies to complement the vulnerability strategy that you've already got to get the outcomes that you need. So. It's all about operationalization of what you're already doing today. So it's all about identification, protection, detection, response, and recovery. So those are five pillars that you want to try and align your IT organization to do. This is um, something called the NIST framework, by the way. So the NIST framework is uh, an American framework. Um, Cyber Essentials has a similar framework. The NTSC has another framework. Uh, there's, there's the CIS controls. There's all sorts of frameworks you can align to, but they all do the same thing. So it's not just about protection, right? You can't just put an endpoint agent out there and say, I am protected. You've got to identify things on your network 24-7, 365. If there's something new that comes on your network, like a, like a virtual machine or a new container, or a new, a new uh, like a, what have I got on my desk? A Raspberry Pi, for random example. You need to be able to see that that's just been added to your network and it's connected via DHCP and it's now broadcasting and it's doing a command and control beacon. You've got to be able to find that really, really quickly. And if you don't have the tools to find that kind of stuff on your network really quickly, you can't protect it. And if you can't protect it, you can't detect it. And then you can't respond for it quickly and therefore you just can't recover. So it's about building this end-to-end -end scope of security operations. Uh, and this is what we align you to. And this is what we do with an Arctic Wolf to drive the outcome that you need. But it's also about continuous improvement and strategic guidance, but without having to use more tools. So it's not a product that you need to uh, invest into. It's not another box with another GUI that you've got to manage. It is, it, it's, a, it's a fully managed operation that gives you 24-7 human-led coverage with the, the response and the outcomes and the actions that you need to respond to those threats. So this is how it works. So with an Arctic Wolf, it's a, it's a fully cloud-native platform. So there's no on-prem service network storage to allocate to this. It's all uh, cloud-native. Um, but one of the major benefits and one of the core design principles that we wanted to do at Arctic Wolf was not force rip and replacement of product. So we leveraged the tech stack that you've already got to get the visibility across your attack surfaces. So um, you might be using a combination of endpoint vendors. So you might be using, I don't know, Sophos. You might be using Bitdefender. You might be using Microsoft Defender. Uh, you might be using you know, Trend Micro, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One. The list goes on. Well, we leverage that tech stack and that visibility to br bring that into our cloud platform via API. Um, but also we do the same thing within your network stack and your firewall stack. We do the same thing in your cloud. So in AWS, Azure, and GCP. But we don't. We go one step further than that. You might be using cloud security tools like Mimecast. Uh, you might be using Proofpoint. You might be using Zscaler. You might be using all these other things like uh, Forcepoint, for example, for web application firewalls. Um, we have the ability to integrate into all those cloud security platforms to get the broad visibility that we need for the potential visibilities of attacks that happen within your environment. Um, we also do that for Active Directory, both on-prem and in uh, Azure with Azure AD. Uh, and then we're monitoring the human interface uh, with, uh, with dark web monitoring for password leakage as well. All of that is pulled into a cloud-native platform. Uh, the cloud native platform is based on a, an architecture which is always designed to be open. So um, we, we don't just work with like five vendors. Uh, at last count, we support 68 different vendors and tech technologies uh, for sending data for correlation into our cloud platform. And the reason why it's taken us 10 years to go international, to come to the UK, this stuff's really hard because log data from a Cisco firewall is different from log data from a Palo Alto firewall. It's different from log data from CrowdStrike. It's different from Microsoft Defender. 
is different from defender for 365 is different for as your uh, sorry aws guard duty for example so we've built all that enrichment and the intelligence to be able to correlate across all these disparate security vendors and platforms that you may be using to then drive analysis and investigations into potential threats that could be happening across all these different cloud platforms that you may not have visibility of today. So the, the, the secret source here is, is that cloud platform. Um, and today, by the way, we're collecting about 250 billion security events that we're then um, trawling through and mining through to drive the outcome that you need uh, for our customers. And the way that we do that is, is via a, a, a delivery model that we call the concierge approach. Because security is, is, as we mentioned, it has a major gap of skills. So if we find an alert and if we find a problem, the last thing that you want is just a random ticket that comes in with a couple of strings that you don't know what to do with. Especially if you start to see, you know, laptops drop off the internet and start being dropped with ransomware, that's that doesn't help anyone. What you need is clear directional guidance about what's going on, how to resolve it, and then people at the end of the phone to walk you through that response. And that's where Arctic Wolf differs. So you get a, a named team of security experts from Arctic Wolf that we call the concierge team, backed by twenty four seven triage analysts and the and the Arctic Wolf cloud platform. And their job now is to give you that actionable guidance and the optimization guidance to harden your security posture over time as part of the service delivery. Now, we don't charge for that. You're not buying a bucket of hours. Um, you don't buy like two remediations a quarter or 10 hours a month. Um, with Arctic Wolf, it's completely unlimited. So if you need us on the phone at 2 in the morning, at 4 in the morning, and at 10 a.m., and then maybe at 2 p.m. for different things, we'll be there. If you get hit with 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 a we'll be there. There's no bucket of hours and we don't kick back and put our feet up and say, sorry, you've got to pay us more money to do so. So it's a completely unlimited experience. And the way that you buy this is it's licensed like a product. Uh, so you like we license it per user. So it's not per device, it's per user. Uh, and then you get um, you get a, a, an Arctic Wolf managed piece of hardware, which does the network monitoring and network detection and inspection on your on your uh, on-prem networks. And then we have the integration stacks that go to the various cloud platforms in, in the tool sets that you're using. So you buy it like a product, but you consume it as a true end-to-end -end service. There's no SIM to buy. There's no um, Splunk on the back end. There's no Microsoft Sentinel to use here. Everything is a, is a turnkey custom designed service with Arctic Wolf, but you buy it like a product. And it's not a ridiculously eye-wateringly costed product either. It's very, very well costed for the mid-market as well. So um, the, the three modules that you can buy within Arctic Wolf. So first off, you've got the detection and response where we're doing 24 seven monitoring of logs, analytical responses. We're doing uh, threat detection. We're doing threat hunting. We're doing triaging. And then we're doing remote incident response for potential breaches or things that could be going on. But we're also doing retention of your log data. So we can now give you compliance purposes. If you're um, uh, required to store data for maybe 12 months for regulatory compliance, we can do that for you. Uh, and we can give you full reports for auditors as well should they need to get access to that data. Now, we do that for three months for free, and then we can ramp that up from 12 months all the way up to 10 years for a very, very small cost as part of our service. We then do risk and vulnerability management, and that's for vulnerabilities on your on-prem network, on the endpoint, on the cloud platforms, in your public cloud, in AWS, Azure, and GCP, uh, and externally, and also on the dark web. So we're continually scanning your environment across the networks, the endpoints, the, ex the external exposures, the cloud exposures, and the exposures on the dark web. And then what we're doing is the concierge team are working with you to give you guidance about what to remediate and how it should be remediated and what the potential threats that we see from zero days and how you're going to go about fixing those. And the third one is awareness. Um, because quite honestly, you know, this all sounds wonderful, but in security, the threat nine times out of 10 is not going to be within your server stack. It's not going to be um, in your cloud stack. To be brutally honest, it's going to be in your users. Because users are the weakest link, because we're all too busy. 
And the problem with remote working is because we, we all now work in isolation with our headphones on and on calls back to back all day, if you get a very, very well that's what we see you know in a huge amount of time and so now it's about making sure that we're delivering customized and hardened security awareness training to users and if we're not doing that iteratively and if we're not doing it consistently but also um, if we're not doing that uh, in a very very short space of time then your users forget uh, there's something called the Ebbinghaus curve where 80% um, of all things that you learn is forgotten within two days Everyone on this call will forget 80% of the things I've talked about on this phone call within 48 hours of us finishing. And that's just the way that we are in the world. So you can't just do awareness training every, every month or every year. Awareness needs to be every week or every two weeks and just reinforcing what's going on not, and not penalizing, not making them feel bad. It's about making them feel good about security. And it's everyone's job to make sure that we all feel secure. So here's a here's a recent example that where we helped a customer um, in the construction industry actually um, react to a to a, a real world ransomware attack which was to do with Exchange, um, and uh, you know everyone on the phone today probably you know knows that Exchange has has had a really really rough couple of years. There's so many vulnerabilities that have been seen within Exchange and zero days within Exchange, and that's ultimately what's um, in my opinion, really accelerated the move to 365. That that and obviously COVID uh, hitting and the require and the, the the kind of desire to use Teams everywhere. Um, and Exchange on prem now is just one of those things that we don't. No one really wants to be managing. It's just, if we can move it to somewhere else and let someone else manage it, that's probably where we want to be. Anyway, I digress. Um, so here, this is what we've seen within Exchange uh, within a customer. So they went live with us. Uh, Monday, August 2nd last year. And uh, the average onboarding time with Arctic Wolf, by the way, is roughly 30 days. So it's not a six month onboarding. It's not arduous. It's not, you know, thousands of pounds of professional services and lots of heartache. Um, it's it's roughly 30 days. In fact, I had a customer uh, on board in 10 working days uh, last month um, because they were a utilities firm. Uh, and they were they were starting to see uh, attacks coming in from Russia on their firewalls or kind of activity on their firewalls, and they were like, we "Just need to shut this down. How quickly can you do this?" And we we did it in in you know kind of one and a half weeks, kind of close to two weeks. So very 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 pleased with that. So we saw that on Monday they went live, and on Saturday we started to see um, PowerShell enumeration commands. So on the Exchange platform, this meant that there was already a backdoor installed on that Exchange platform. And we started to see the PowerShell enumeration commands. So most attacks happen because you've got some sort of Trojan or backdoor installed on your environment. And then the, the downside of PowerShell is it just it makes it so easy for script kiddies or just randomers be able to just grab a script for the internet and be able to scan for that Trojan that's installed around the world. And they can just drop this script in a PowerShell command, and that will then remotely connect to you, and then it will start doing a command and control B connect. It's so easy, it's untrue. So we started to see this activity start, and we saw it through our agent that was installed on the Exchange platform. Within um, within two minutes, we flagged this up in, in the cloud platform. So the, the response was not hours or days, it was within two minutes, uh, We the cloud platform has flagged this up as anomalous, and we needed to investigate it. Uh, we then spent the next 15 minutes investigating all the logs and all the things that were going on within our triage team. And we believe it was the re ransomware gang that was starting to expose a customer uh, that we needed to ticket and we needed to start working with the customer on. So then what we started to see, once the PowerShell commandlet is executed, that allows a communication with the bad actor to drop remote control software to your environment. Now, that might be something like AnyDesk, uh, it could be Team Viewer. It could be it could be you know VNC. It could be there's many many kind of remote control software tools out there. Um, in this case, it was SVN. So SVN was was dropped onto the Exchange server rem remotely from the script kitty. That then allowed them. They then did another PowerShell commandlet to then do a remote executable to connect to a command and control server. Once they connect to a command and control server elsewhere, they've now got full remote control of your environment. 
and it even persists po post reboot, by the way. So even if you were to reboot, you know, force a reset, whatever it may be, that still persists. So they've now got full control as to everything that's going on. Once they do that, they then, um, the, the next kind of layer in the kill chain is they start adding themselves as local admins. Because once they've got local admin rights, they can then elevate and then do, move uh, laterally within your environment, east, west, within your network. So we started to see this activity within the environment. We're still monitoring. We're working with the customer to do the remediation and the triaging. What was interesting was this customer uh, was using an endpoint protection platform from Sentinel-1, one of the best in the market, in my opinion. But Sentinel-1 um, and, and a lot of endpoint protection vendors just don't see the things that we see within our platform because we use, um, we use Sysmon and a load of low-level configuration tools to get the, the, the underlying state within Windows into our environment that typically endpoint protect, uh, protection vendors miss. So Sentinel-1 only started flagging the problem when the, the, the bad actors started moving laterally across your environment. And that's when uh, they start to kind of start to look around your environment, you know, do data exfiltration if they can, or they just lie dormant and you don't even know they're there. And they might be there for weeks, they might be there for months, um, on average, uh, the, the the dwell time is roughly 200 days. So a bad actor is normally in your environment for just over six months. Um, and, and this is how it happens, ultimately. And so we've taken the, the dwell time from 200 days to a period of under an hour, pretty much. And the, we took the customer, the customer along with us, we took the Exchange server offline for the containment, and then we came back in on Monday to do the remediation. So on, on Monday, we then did remote remediation with the customer. So we're not hands-on keyboard. We're not here to make production changes to your network or to your environment. That's ultimately your job. We're here to give you that remote guidance about how to clear things down, how to shut down those attacks. So when when you know you're in the when you're staring at the coal face, when you're really in the heat of the moment about how to respond to an attack. We're giving you that guidance. Go do this. Now go do this. Click on this button here. Type in this. We're giving you that knowledge and that transfer to give you the support behind the scenes to know how to remediate. But we're not going to just dial into your environment and make hard changes to your network. That's where bad things happen, in my opinion. So we do the remediation. We shut that down. But we then go one step further because we need to find out how they got in in the first place. So we did a vulnerability scan. We found that the scan missed all those critical patches that they should have been applying, but they hadn't, including all those zero days. And they found that the patching tool was misconfigured and malfunctioning. So we then built a script to identify all of the potential breaches they could be vulnerable or susceptible to. We found the backdoor in their environment, and we then helped them with clearing down that backdoor in the web shells. But we don't just stop there. We then gave them consultative guidance to help them with implementing MFA for, for VPN services. Moving to 365, you know, turning on 365 for cloud applications, turning on 365, uh, turning on Defender for cloud apps, Defender for 365, for example, and then additional group policies to stop this PowerShell enumeration happening on the future. But all of that happened even though the customer only went live on the Monday. So there's no 90-day warm-up period. There's no, oh, we've got to learn your environment to figure out what's good and what's bad. Well, as soon as you go live with Arctic Wolf, you get the benefit of 10 years worth of intelligence and 10 years worth of knowledge of all the threats that potentially we've ever responded to. So even though it might be new to you, it's certainly not new to us. And we're able to respond to that threat as quickly as we possibly can to help you with that remediation. What it means for you, this is just not something that becomes noisy because we're all about reducing noise, not adding to your day. So on average, I mentioned that we're observing about 250 billion security events per day, but per customer, that equates to less than five incidents per week that we're working with you with. So it's really not something that's going to burn your time. You don't need to hire more people to just cover what we're doing. What we're doing now is we're filtering that noise and we're focusing the mindset on these are the real things that we need to do, and this is how we're going to go about doing it. And it's all about complete visibility. And this is where we, we stand alone, really, because 
if you look at you know security service providers who who do like a managed sim for example uh, they might be doing managed sims they might get some firewall data they might get some endpoint data but that's pretty much it uh, they might man you know some vendors mandate the tools that you use so you know they might say oh you can only use you know uh, endpoint vendor a or b um, they might not be able to pull the data from things like 365 or from Google Workspace or from you know GCP, for example. So for us, it's all about complete visibility across your entire attack service to make sure that you've got those outcomes defined, but also make sure that you, you've got that coverage because as we're moving to more cloud services, that's where the threats are coming from. And then you add the human element in with the phishing simulations and the, and the constant re-enablement that we need to build. It's all about building the holistic picture of security in your environment. So unfortunately, endpoint vendors and firewalls alone are not enough anymore. Um, it's all about this holistic vis visibility. It's all about unifying everything that you've got in the environment, plus the new tools that you're looking at and the new things and the new models like, like, um, like, like uh, Zero Trust, for example, to make sure that we're to, to kind of drive into those outcomes, but also completing the picture of visibility across your attack service. Because cyber assurance, as I mentioned, is, is, the, is one of the big, big problems that we're seeing at the board level. Um, so this is a real thing that we're, we're being pressured on. And if you look at what cyber insurance um, are mandating from a controls perspective, these are like the top, uh, the top 12 things that they're, they're, they're kind of working on. So the the first, there's, there's some really obvious things that everyone should be doing, right? So multi-factor authentication is one thing that we absolutely, everyone should be doing right now. Secured and tested backups, but also not just backing up, testing the recoveries and making sure that you can recover in the right SLA that you need to get them back with. Um, vulnerability management, but also managing those vulnerabilities continuously making sure that we're continually patching systems, filtering your emails and making sure that you've got web content filtering, protected networks, privileged access management, making sure that you don't, do not have admin passwords uh, lying around that multiple people have access to, right? But also actually, you know, just a sidebar as well, which is um, password control is one of those things um, where I don't know if you do like a, a rotation of 90 days for passwords today, if you do a 90 day password rotation today, that's actually bad practice because most users will just append a number at the end of your password rotation. And if you do a password rotation where you add in the number, if that password gets leaked, what happens is most of the, most of the password leakage now just iterate the numbers on the end as part of the automation. So they might be on like month 13 and they've got 13 at the end of the password. Well, if that password's leaked, once they get to 13, bang, they're into your solution. So really, it's about making sure that you've got really good security password control. And password control might not even be a, uh, an, uh, it might not be a word. It should be something like a phrase, you know, like, a, like th you know, think of something random, like, you know, I feed my horses to uh, brown sugar cubes. And you take the first two letters of that, sent of that sentence, and that becomes your password. And those are the things, those are the, the techniques that ultimately improve your security posture, but make it easier for users to remember as well. So there's kind of little nuggets there as well. But if you look at what Arctic Wolf does and how we solve for it, we really fill in the gaps alongside the things that you do today, right? Around MFA and backups and, and where the good, good boys and girls from Computer will come in around the managed services and helping you with things like, um, 365 migrations and endpoint security. So um, I want to wrap up with, so how do we do all this? So you've got the three modules, as I mentioned previously. So the three modules do not all have to be, you know, purchased together, but actually, you know, for most organizations that have nothing today, there's a really, really good case for doing all three together, delivered by the same concierge team, because you've got the same experience across all the platforms. But if you're using tools from other vendors today, that's absolutely fine. You know, don't break what's already working for you. Again, it's about strength and depth. It's about adding things to it, not just rip and replacing. So it's about human-led monitoring. Don't just rely on a product that uses AI 
to remove human remediation. You need human remedi remediation to see through that noise sometimes. Um, it's about continuous visibility of risks and remediations. Um, don't just let this become overwhelming and let it wash over you and then just rely on a pen test every year. You've got to do this all the time to make sure that you're, you're, you're aware of it. And then finally, fix the gap in the workforce. Make sure they're always aware of security, but make it fun and make it engaging and make it so they feel that they're part of the solution, not the problem. And if you can do those things, you're on a really, really good track to harden your security posture and iterate around uh, your security uh, outcomes that you need uh, across your, your um, attack surface. But if there's only one thing you do, and it's the one thing I did call out previously as well, it's about incident response. It's not an if, it's a when. It's a real sad state of affairs where we are today. Make sure you have an incident response plan documented and defined. Um, make sure you've got roles and responsibilities. Who are you calling? When are you calling them? In what order are they being called in? What are they going to do for you? How long is it going to take? Make sure that you've got those third parties also defined and how much it potentially costs you as well. The, the worst thing you want is if you're, you're in a security incident and you bring in that third party and you find out it's a huge eye-watering cost to do so. So you need to make sure everything's defined and documented. But you also should test the plan regularly and make sure that you're always changing for lessons learned because you should know what your partners do, but know how fast these things happen and what the potential shortfalls may be and how you work around them. All right, so um, I wanna thank you very much for, for joining uh, today's session. And uh, yeah, so hopefully that was a, a, a good um, use of your time for 20, for you know, kind of 45 minutes. Um, I wanted to really give you some nuggets there outside of what we do at Arctic Wolf, just to kind of, you know, things that you could take away that you can improve on. You know, you've been doing a huge amount of, you know, you, well, computer world have really changed from a, an infrastructure virtualization, um, you know, kind of leading partner into really more cloud uh, 365 collaboration um, and security around that. I mean, what's, what are the summer challenges you've seen uh, organizations on that journey as they move, you know, kind of move into the, the 365 model? Yeah, thank you, Nick. I think, as you say, there is just so much going on in the IT space at the moment, not just trying to keep control of security and all the challenges that you're alluding to here, but people trying to think about what is the, the journey into Azure? How do we actually implement this cloud first strategy that we might have had for the last three to five years, trying to keep the lights on, trying to look to deliver better experiences to the users kind of thing. And I think most organizations that we speak to have a desire to strengthen security. But as you've already alluded to, most of those do that by layering tools on top of it, which creates the noise, creates the challenge. And it's very difficult to actually make momentum moving forward. So what's been really important to us in the relationship with Arctic Wolf is this offers a way for organizations that are taking security seriously to actually move forward, to get that visibility. I really like the timeline that you put up there. And, and I asked the people that are kind of attending this webinar or watching the recording, would you have detected that that was going on inside your organization? Do you have the tooling there? And even if you did, do you have the confidence that you would have been able to remediate it in such a way uh, so quickly? So I think it's all really good stuff there, lots of stuff going on. Uh, just a reminder, we've got the event coming up uh, at Silverstone um, towards the end of the month, uh, which is in the chat or you'll find on the event page. Any final thoughts, Nick, before we close off? I guess my final thought really is, um, you know, this is not, uh, security doesn't have a destination. It doesn't matter where you are on this journey, right? You could be right at the very beginning. You could be, you know, all the way to, towards the end. It, it's this is always about continuous improvement. So, uh, what we're talking about today, I can guarantee you, will completely change in a year's time. There's always, and that's the beauty of what we're working with in this cloud world. We can harness these new things. So, it's all about taking the best of the things that you see. Find out where your where your organization is, where your potential gaps are, and what those risks are to the board. So think about you know kind of mapping your board level discussions to what we do in IT. 
that then gets you some of the way to work out what are the things that we need to work on first. Definitely. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Nick. Thank you, everyone that's joined us or watched the recording. Uh, if you'd like any more information, please reach out to your Computer World account manager. Um, or alternatively, you can email me, Barry C at computerworld.co.uk. So thank you once again, Nick, and thank you for everyone that's attended. Cheers.